I was given the distinct privilege of introducing our keynote speaker uh, this afternoon, uh, Dr. Kemal Kirishchi. He's currently the senior fellow, uh, Tusiad senior fellow of, uh, and director of the Center on the United States and Europe's Turkey Project at the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C. But for years before that, he was at Boazici University, one of the very top excellent university, the Bosphorus also, you know, translated into English, Bosphorus University, one of the really excellent uh, top one or two uh, universities really in the country. Um, and uh, at that time, he was the Jean Monnet Chair uh, and Professor of International Relations. And if any of you were in the earlier session, uh, sessions and you saw these confessional stand-ups and saying that, you know, I was once his student, you know, years ago, uh, you understand that he was a bit of an institution there. And, uh, and so it's, it's great to have him today. My own experience, unfortunately, I can't stand up and say that I had him as a student, unfortunately. My experience with uh, Professor Kurishchi was a little different. I remember at Bill Kent, you know, the rival university, uh, preparing when I was doing my PhD, preparing for my comprehensive exam, and I was going over uh, one of the areas of our exam was Turkish politics, and I remember going over uh, the the Kurdish issue, and uh, I remember go, you know going through the literature, and there was there's lots there's subsequently been lots of works and seminal works on the, the Kurdish issue but I, I remember going back you know into, into the 90s and things when things were really hot and it wasn't all that acceptable to even call it an issue still uh, in Turkey at that time and if you look at the works the major works on the Kurdish question the Kurdish issue in that time they're all written by you know people whose last name are Barkey or Fuller or um, so anyway, non-Turkish names. And right in the midst of this time, you see one work that does have a Turkish scholar's name, someone from Turkey writing on the Kurdish issue. And I have to say, even then I was impressed that, you know, here's, here's a guy who took a risk I mean, for scholarship and writing an excellent work at a time when it, there might have been some blowback. And I haven't been able to ask him that question, what, what you know, what were some of the consequences that I'm sure existed for writing a book on the Kurdish question at that time? That's not all he's done, though. And uh, since then, he's he's done excellent work on Turkey and the EU, on immigration, uh, foreign policy, uh, economic foreign policy. Uh, you could pretty much consult him on any and every issue, really, uh, with current uh, Turkish politics. Um, and for that reason, we're in very good hands this afternoon for our keynote speech uh, entitled Turkey and Turbulence, Domestic Problems and Their Foreign Policy Implications. So without wasting any more of his precious time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kemal Kirishji. Let's give him a hand. Well, thanks for the uh, generous introduction. However, let me warn you, there's a very good American saying, don't count your chicken before they hatch. <laughs> so take whatever he, Mike has said with a pinch of salt, at least for until after the uh, pre presentation. I, I am really delighted to be with you here, and it's very exciting that this topic should be addressed here in Lawrence and at uh, the University of K Kansas. And I'm glad that United managed to fly us out of Washington, D.C. Uh, into Kansas City yesterday <laughs> evening. But my praise for United won't go any further than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were great presentations this morning by uh, my Turkish colleagues. Let me warn you, you might have had a feel of it. We as a nation like to talk. And uh, we can lecture for until time people crawl on the floor, <laughs> and especially Turkish professors. And there was the case of one such professor who had the unfortunate experience of uh, addressing an audience in Germany, where time is precious and it's Swiss timing. You know, 
everything works like clockwork. And uh, he's given his 20 minutes, 30 minutes, but he's there after 40 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour goes by and people are restless and you see people slowly, uh, surely leaving. And then by the time it's an hour and a half, there's only one person sitting right in the front row and uh, the Turkish professor eventually gets the message and concludes his uh, delivery and uh, walks up to that person and thanks him for his interest and inquires for the reason. And uh, the German chap says, well, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so let me warn uh, the uh, members of the next uh, p panel. Uh, this, I dare not call this presentation I'm going to share with you a, a, a scientific presentation in the sense of being based on the kind of work that my friends and colleagues have uh, shared with you this morning. I will allow myself uh, further to Mike's introduction to be a bit more speculative and please make allowance for the fact that it will be speculative. We are going through, uh, as the Chinese proverb says, interesting times in Turkey, but also in Turkey's neighborhood, if not beyond uh, as well. So what I'm going to try to do uh, today is look at Turkey in turbulence, but also in its neighborhood, the neighborhood going through uh, turbulence as uh, as well. And I will argue, as it has already been done uh, this morning, that Turkey's infamous zero problems with neighbors policy is, uh, is gone. But there is an element of that policy that is still surviving. And there I use a street language expression and say it may well be on its last legs. And if that element of this foreign policy collapses too, I would say we are heading for very serious geostrategic implications as far as the West uh, uh, goes. <coughs> Turbulence is, is, is, a, is one of those funny uh, terms that is difficult to pin down, but in many ways, what Turkey is experiencing right now and what the neighborhood is experiencing, especially with the events unfolding in uh, Crimea and Ukraine, not to mention also uh, Syria that has been with us for too long so, uh, so far, the crisis there, there is a turbulence going on there. The domestic element of that turbulence has been recognized by uh, the Turkish President Abdullah Gül as well on a flight either to or from Italy uh, not that long, long ago. Uh, the regional uh, turbulence I've already made references to. I'm not going to take you through this uh, PowerPoint presentation. There are fearful tables there <laughs> filled and bursting with numbers and figures to do with patterns in Turkish trade. They are there just in case you, uh, you suspect what I'm saying and need to go back and actually check uh, the, uh, the fact, facts. Instead, what I'm going to do is uh, take you through very quickly three phases of Turkish foreign policy during the reign of uh, the current political power, uh, party in power power. These three phases are, of course, my own in invention, and you're very welcome to, to challenge these three phases in terms of uh, when they begin, when they end, or for that matter, in terms of their, uh, their actual uh, content. But the, the story behind those three phases is that, in terms of the presentations I have and the thesis I'd like to share with you, is that especially in the first phase, Turkey was a dynamic player that was helping modestly to transform its neighborhood 
and incorporated very gradually and often in a in a very invisible way into the uh, political economic system that the West had put into place in the aftermath of the Second World War. And that system is actually being questioned nowadays, not only from the economic per perspective, but also from a political one. And I will return to it, and the speculative part will be at a time when more and more Turkey not only looks in turbulence, but looks like it is rudderless that it's adrift, how Turkey might be brought back uh, in, into, into a path with a vision that can contribute to that uh, uh, tra transformation. Uh, just to help you to visualize what I have in mind, I'd like to share with you a, a map very quickly to, to give you an idea. This is my, the way I see it. The way I see it is that there are two competing, if not today, with what's happening in Ukraine, conflicting forms of governance. One form of governance is, can be called the transatlantic form of governance that stresses the kinds of values that we have attributed to pluralist democracy and a liberal liberal market and the competing the competing form of governance is the one that is best represented by Russia Iran China sometimes they call them they call it a sovereign uh, democracy where state capitalism prevails and uh, the, the, uh, the issue of the economist I made references to very much plays with this idea as well, even if it may not be using these, these terms. And uh, about Turkey there is that it straddles the very geography where these two forms of governance are confronting <laughs> each other, competing uh, with each other. And I, I think this morning's debate and discussion very much address some of the issues associated with this competition, including this notion of Turkey once being a, a model there. Back to these three phases of uh, Turkey's foreign policy during AKP's reign. The one from 2002-2009, and here I'd like to uh, introduce a qualification. This doesn't mean that this policy came in purely and solely with the arrival of AKP. There were elements of it. The ideas were circulating. Ismail Cem, a, a former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and uh, bless his soul as well, was toying with these ideas and was in introducing them. Turgut Özal clearly was a leader that very much thought along those lines and began to adopt policies somewhat reflected in uh, the uh, period uh, from 2002-2009. But I think what is distinctive about AKP is that, like in domestic politics, in foreign policy too, they were able to develop a very clear vision and a vision associated with, again, a, a, a project that you could lay your hands uh, on. The zero problems aspect of it uh, you're familiar with. Uh, I won't go into the details, but just in case, this idea, there was this morning a reference to Turkey as a post-Cold War warrior or, or a, a Turkey that was kind of at war with its neighborhood. It almost came to the brink of war over a couple of uh, in uninhabited islands in the Aegean with Greece in 1996, February. I distinctly, vividly recall uh, those, uh, those days there. Two years down the line, Turkey mobilized a good chunk of its army and uh, uh, sent them right up to the Syrian border, about to, as they were putting it, walk the army through uh, uh, Syria. 
Uh, there was the occasion when Iranian territory was supposedly accidentally attacked or bombed by Turkish uh, military fighter pla planes. Uh, there was, unfortunately, Turgut Özal's expression about lobbing a couple of artillery shells into uh, Armenia to cool it down in the context of its conflict with uh, Azerbaijan. We, can, we could continue with, the, with this list. But by the time we come to the uh, uh, period of AKP, we see that this policy is uh, re reversed, whereby Zero Problems seeks to develop cooperative relations with neighboring countries, but also address some of the fundamental conflicts in Turkish foreign policy, Cyprus being probably the most vivid, conspicuous, and challenging uh, one when, uh, the, when this government convinced the Turkish side and the Turkish Cypriots to vote in support of a plan, UN plan, to reunite, reintegrate uh, the, uh, the island uh, there. Additionally, zero problems policy also addressed the idea t that Turkey could play a, a mediatory role uh, in conflicts that had nothing to do with Turkey. And the one that was, again, most conspicuous and striking was the way in which uh, the Turkish foreign minister and the prime minister himself almost brought Syria and Israel to direct talks in 2008. I mean, can you for one moment imagine how the Middle East would have looked like had those direct talks started there? And in it went, the whole exercise went hellwire, hell wire or hay, whatever the expression is, haywire, uh, right about in 2002, 2009, when the prime minister chose to wiggle that famous finger and call for one minute in his an intervention with uh, Shimon Peres in, uh, in, in Davos. The vision there and the accompanying project, and this is again looking at things from where I stand, and in especially as Mike pointed out, from the perspective of someone who has taken his Jean Monnet chairmanship seriously and has been affected, influenced by Jean Monnet's ideas. When I look at this, this period, and when I look at uh, the, the policies and uh, the agenda that especially the foreign minister had in mind, and I've never had a chance to discuss this with him or with his colleagues, and it's possible that they may completely disagree with uh, what I'm going to say, say and actually may feel uncomfortable being associated with Jean Monnet. But what, the way I see it, Davutoglu and his uh, co uh, colleagues so the exercise of economic integration, similar to the one in Europe from the late 40s, early 50s onwards, as an exercise for integrating the Middle East and overcoming its divisions, its conflicts. With, with and I think Jean Monnet had that agenda too, even if it may have not been openly uh, stated. Just to give you an idea, when Jean Monnet was given the task to examine France's economy, the state of France's economy, by Charles de Gaulle in 1946-47, one thing that struck him was that the newest plant, a steel plant, that France had dated from 1906, and it was in Alsace-Lorraine, and it was a German plant, all right? So to me, Jean Monnet clearly had a, a, a, a France's economic national interest in mind as well, be the other, putting the other issues on the side. I believe similarly, Davutoglu and his colleagues also had Turkey's economic interest in, in mind. And that the Middle East, as it integrated and as it addressed and resolved its problems, would also become an important economic partner for Turkey, not to mention a market as, uh, as well. And uh, the, this idea 
peaked, I think, in Dautolu's mind in 2010. So it's a bit ironic that it's outside the 2009 limit there. When he, when he addressed a crowd, I think it was in Beirut in the context of a Turkish Arab economic meeting, where he envisaged a Middle East in which goods and people would move freely from Kars on the Armenian border all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. And in that context came the visa liberalization policies that were uh, made references to. In that con context also came these common strategic cabinet meetings to try to regulate the nitty gritty of uh, integrating the Turkish economy with neighboring Middle Eastern economies uh, as much as possible, not different in many ways, exercise-wise, uh, with what would, was happening in Europe in, in the 1950s. That was the vision. And I think it was a vision that was welcomed, interestingly, by uh, the players in the Middle East. It was welcomed at the international level, and it, this is the context in which the idea of a model also uh, emerged <coughs> there. Yet when we come in 2009, and interestingly, this is ta the time when Davutoglu changes personalities from being a technocrat, an academic, a bureaucrat, if you wish, an expert, to becoming a politician, a politician overlooking, looking over his uh, shoulder uh, as far as votes and uh, elections, etc. Uh, uh, go. From 2009, roughly again, to the summer of 2013, I see, again, this is my subjective evaluation, and uh, this, is, uh, this is what I see from where I stand, is a, a Turkish policy that is becoming increasingly interventionist. Uh, increasingly betraying, if you wish, the, uh, the elements of that project, visionary project, from the first uh, period. How come? In the first period, the exercise is one where you're working to achieve a goal through economic integration. And economic integration is a, is a uh, non-zero game, if you wish. Everybody is going to benefit from it, a win-win exercise. Clearly, I remember talking in 2009 to Syrian uh, actors in Damascus, the first and only time I made it to Syria, and I could sense this discomfort, a recognition that clearly from this exercise, Turkey was going to win more, Syria was going to win less. But what is important is that they both would be winning. Okay. So in many ways, this is a win-win uh, exercise. And it, it's an exercise uh, also based on consensus bu uh, building there. <coughs> in the second period, and correct me if I'm wrong, we see the introduction for the first time, the notions of Düzen Kurucu, the notion that Turkey will be a a, an order setting country. And that Turkey, as the uh, title of this conference suggests, will, is a center player, a, a, a, a player around which the rest of the, maybe not the world, but the region revi uh, revolves. A game that is clearly a hegemonic game, a hierarchical uh, game. And not uh, surprisingly, this is also a time when you begin to uh, uh, observe reactions to it. However, of course, what is unplanned and unexpected is the way in which the Arab Spring would turn south. In the initial stages of the Arab Spring, I lived through it. In Turkey, in this respect, there was considerable excitement. Maybe the notions of Düzen Kurucu, uh, order setting, that concept, and the notion of being the center, 
emerged in this context. Here is an Arab Spring uh, looking forward to the transformation of the Arab world or the Arab geography in the direction uh, of an Arab world that would share similar aspirations as Turkey in terms of democracy, in terms of a liberal um, a market, etc. And that's also the point. And uh, please trust me that I sat down and read uh, the current president, but previously the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Abdullah Gül's collated uh, speeches. It's available as a huge book. And what struck me is that I had always thought that the AKP government was somewhat different than previous governments when it came to shaping its neighborhood and shaping developments in the domestic affairs of neighboring countries. When you read these speeches of Abdullah Gül, you're struck by the fact that he too shares these what I would call classic Turkish Republican values. Don't stick your nose in your neighbor's uh, affairs. The way he puts it is, is, of course, a bit more nuanced, a bit more based on the idea that you have to work with these uh, actors, but not intervene in any obvious, conspicuous, direct manner that, for example, George Bush's Middle Eastern project was based on uh, or in the form of actually contacting players there and providing the financing of projects, etc. But more working behind the scenes, bringing up the issues maybe is the difference from the practice of, uh, of, uh, of the past. But once the Arab Spring turns sour, you become interventionist and interventionist in a very committed way with the Syrian uh, crisis there, and I, I will spare the details. But what also is interesting between the two uh, periods there, clearly in the, two, in the first period, domestic politics plays a role as well. There is a pressure from bottom up on the uh, AKP government to open up markets around the world. This is the context in which you have to see the reference that uh, Turkey or Davutoglu uh, uh, enjoys mentioning that Turkey has the largest number of embassies uh, outside its, uh, compared to other countries. This is the context in which Turkish Airlines begins to fly <coughs> into all kinds of uh, cities and towns around in, uh, in Africa. But this is also the context in which Anatolian Tigers are putting pressure on the government to open up uh, these uh, markets. This is also the context in which you have to understand the visa liberalization policies of the RKP government in, in, in that uh, particular period. So domestic politics was present in the first phase too. But in the second phase, domestic politics was more of a populistic domestic politics. And, uh, no wonder that the wiggling of the finger came within weeks of the uh, uh, previous local elections in 2009. Uh, no wonder Turkey became interventionist in the case of uh, Syria. The links to populist domestic politics was uh, clear in, uh, in the second phase too. When we come to the uh, third phase, and that's the most recent phase, and the turning point to me is the visit of Erdogan to Washington, D.C. I was partly privy to it. And I saw how in the State Department, in the Truman Hall, I, I can't compare it, but I have heard it from, uh, from people, that the State Department laid out for, for uh, the Prime Minister the reddest red carpet treatment that you could think of including flowery, generous remarks to, his, to the members of his family. I wonder if they would do it, given the, uh, the video that has been released in, uh, in recent times. But it, it, the United States was in some way looking up at Erdogan there. 
And I think it was looking up to it in the context of this thesis I have in, uh, in, uh, in mind. But as soon as the prime minister returned, within days, the Gezi Park uh, events broke out. And as Mike has made references, amongst those who get blamed beside Lufthansa German Airways, which I find very mind-boggling as to why Lufthansa Airways gets picked on. Uh, you know, there are reasons, but I uh, still. I mean, stretching your rationality to that extent is, is what uh, shocks me. Uh, but the United States also took its fare of why the Gezi Park uh, uh, happened uh, uh, there. From, from then on, I begin to see the demise of Turkey's modernness. I've given you the Ganushi experience uh, during the panel session. Uh, I won't uh, repeat it here. But I am also beginning to see, I can't find the appropriate term, and I'm sure it's out there in the political science uh, li uh, literature, but a default policy, a default policy that is being run by the bureaucrats, basically by the Turkish foreign ministry. And uh, we see it with respect to Syria. Uh, the prime minister in May had come to Washington, D.C. to persuade Obama that an intervention should take place, military intervention. The least, there should be a humanitarian safe zone uh, created. Instead, he returned accepting uh, rather reluctantly the idea of Geneva II and a, a diplomatic effort to address the Syrian, uh, Syrian crisis there. In August, when the chemical weapons issue propped up, there was a moment of excitement on the part of the government again that a military intervention might be in the works, and that has not occurred. In that context, there were a number of issues that came up, very sensitive issues. The issue of uh, assisting radical uh, Islamic groups, the issue of financing them. Very recently, a report has come out in, uh, in Washington, D.C. on the financing of uh, terrorism and Turkish links to it. In, in foreign affairs, there was an article called Turkey's Dirty Money. These issues, very sensitive issues, began to be handled behind closed doors, basically by bureaucrats. The, the issue of handling the opposition and bringing the opposition to the Geneva II talks that uh, took place in, uh, in January uh, was again handled and supported by the Turkish government, but very much handled, I believe, by, by the bureaucrats. So in, in the first phase, when you had this vision and this idealism of, uh, for shaping a troublesome region uh, and transform it towards a, a, a more peaceful, stable, and prosperous uh, region, I think we begin in the last time to see realist, I mean, hardcore, uh, Hobbesian, if you wish, Ma Machiavellian, or Hans Morgenthau type of realism that is very much managed very discreetly, very much behind the scenes by those bureaucrats have, who have been steeped in perceiving world politics from the perspective of that realism and working with that world from the perspective of uh, uh, re uh, realism with an absence of a project of Turkey, as far as foreign policy goes today, I think it's difficult to say that it has actually a project on its, uh, uh, on its agenda, and it's not surprising that it does not have it. What are the domestic implications of uh, the turbulence itself in, in Turkey in the context of this last phase that I made references to? In Washington, D.C., I am increasingly hearing in open as well as closed, uh, closed sessions, and declarations are being made by prominent personalities in D.C., including ambassadors that have 
that have served in, uh, uh, in Ankara, not to men mention reports that are being, that is coming out, annual reports coming out from the State Department, including the Human Rights Report, where an anxiety is expressed that, that Turkey is increasingly failing to share the commitment to Western political economic values, uh, values. So question marks are being raised about Turkey's membership to the trans transatlantic community. Uh, earlier on, I think Karen made references to how there was a period when Turkey seemed to people in Washington, D.C., drifting away uh, from, uh, from the West. And the uh, reference was made to the article, I believe, by Philip Gordon, who uh, held for a long time an important position uh, in uh, Obama's administration, that who lost Turkey. In this case, it's not about who lost Turkey. Turkey is losing itself, uh, drifting away from those uh, values there. Secondly, very serious questions began to be raised about hardcore security issues. This issue of Chinese missiles. I have been in a number of meetings, and most recently in a meeting where two prominent members of, uh, of the uh, Foreign Affairs Commission of the Turkish Parliament were there. I think they were both aware how uncomfortable they had made, especially the US, but other NATO allies with this Chinese missile issue. The, the, the, the framework in which they put the missile issue, and this has been the case for some time, is in a very, is the expression bazargan, you know, in a very pazar, pazar you know, in a, in a, in, in petty trading, as if you're buying carpets, right? And that the intention is that the problem there is Chinese want to share the technology, which is good, <laughs> but they are also offering a much lower price. So it's an exercise in trying to convince this side <laughs> to lower their, their price without realizing that this comes with a package. That, yes, the price of uh, European or American <laughs> missile systems compared to China might be of a higher nature, but then Turkey has been part of a system that at least has kept Turkey from drifting into the mess that Syria is in and Ukraine is flying. So, you, you know, there, there's a benefit that comes from a benefit that you would not be able to price on the basis of just billions of dollars that has come to Turkey, and they fail to see it. The fact that they're failing to see it is a concern in itself to the United States and uh, Western allies putting aside the technical problems, the, the fear that if Chinese missiles are bought by Turkey and that Turkey tries to integrate the system into the NATO defense system, that the Chinese would have an ear on what the uh, Western alliances are. That, that's a technical concern. I think it's the other concern that has been much more uh, uh, serious. The mixed record with res respect to regional stability, uh, I've already uh, mentioned it in, uh, with uh, respect to especially Syria, but also Iraq. Over Iraq, too, there were some uh, differences, especially with respect to the uh, Kurdish oil and natural gas being pumped into Turkey, across Turkey, to uh, markets beyond uh, Turkey without the approval of Baghdad. There, too, there's been some repair work that has been done. And my understanding that at least some of that rep repair work is again the product uh, of bureaucrats becoming engaged there. A mixed record as far as uh, Iran goes, and uh, I think one aspect of the December corruption scandal that uh, went somewhat unnoticed in uh, the Turkish media is the way in which that scandal also revealed the extent to which Turkey was 
violating sanctions on, uh, on, uh, on, on Iran. And uh, the next step is there is the issue of uh, financing going to what the West regards to be terrorist groups. Maybe I should open a bracket, bracket here. Uh, I'm not private to the technical details of this issue, and I must confess that I'm not someone who's on top of this issue, the issue of financing terrorism and terrorist groups. I understand the issue here is not that Turkey is directly financing uh, these terrorist groups, but somehow there is money that is coming through Turkey reaching these, these groups, and a lot of that money is coming uh, from the alternative soft power in, uh, in the Middle East, the alternative reference point, and some, some Gulf states. And part and parcel of, of this exercise, or the way uh, one other important, uh, one other factor that makes this issue important is this, this group called the Financial Action Task Force. This is a group of uh, Western countries as well as African Latin American countries that try to cooperate and coordinate their financial services so that there is no money laundering and money going to terrorist groups uh, occurring. And uh, this is where Turkey is having problems, that the level of cooperation falls short of what is expected and that Turkey remains in a gray list. And this is in complete and utter conflict with the prime minister's ambitions to make Istanbul a financial hub. Today, if you want to send, uh, if parents want to send $2,000, $5,000 to their uh, uh, kids studying in the United States, that amount of money takes much longer to travel from Turkey to the United States than if Belgian parents or German parents sending the same amount of money to the United States goes. And this has very serious implications in terms of uh, business, trade, etc., to which I'd like to uh, uh, uh, return uh, through the final point. Now, all this, this picture that I've tried to uh, to uh, draw is beginning to risk the jeopardizing of the trading state. And uh, jeopardizing this remaining element of the zero problems policy uh, risks having serious geostrategic consequences. And this is the context in which I'd like you to go back to uh, that map. And that's the context in which I'll, I'll come to my final uh, uh, re uh, remarks. <coughs> I believe the United States and the EU or the transatlantic community are engaged in an exercise to revise and revamp the, uh, that political economic system that was put into place right after the Second World War, meaning the IMF, the World Bank, the trading system, the old GATT that has become the uh, uh, WTO. Uh, and this exercise is occurring in two contexts. One context is the economic crisis through which that the United States and Europe has been going through and is having difficulties in coming out of Right, the recent figures from the United States, too, in terms of em employment and economic growth r remains un unsettled, not to mention the ones in the European uh, Union. And the second uh, context or uh, consequence of this effort relates to the map that I showed you earlier on, this competition. What is going to happen to the future of the world? Is the future, is the world in the future going to be some reformed version of the system that was put into place in the aftermath of the Second World War? Or is the world going to drift increasingly into chaos or into one where the rules of the game, meaning trading rules, uh, movement of people, 
economic cooperation, resolving of the political issues uh, will be achieved in the context of the rules that increasingly is being preferred by Russia, and we see a manifestation of it right these days, uh, preferred by Iran, preferred by uh, uh, uh, China. Where is, going, where is Turkey going to be in, in that context, I think is the question that I'm trying to uh, uh, answer there. Until the end of that first period, and maybe partly into the second period, Turkey was clearly being perceived as a country that is trying to integrate its neighborhood into that post-Second World War system and maybe into the exercises of its tra uh, transformation. How was it being done? Uh, in my tables, you will see that in the course of the last 10, 15 years, uh, it was mentioned earlier on, the European Union's share in Turkey's trade in percentages term has, has decreased. In real terms, it has increased. And fascinatingly, it has increased even more in the course of the last six months and in the course of 2013. And that in itself is very telling in terms of where Turkey maybe is trying to move, uh, uh, move there. What has increased in percentages is Turkey's engagement with its neighborhood. That Turkey is trading much more with its neighborhood and people from Turkey's immediate neighborhood, and especially the northern neighborhood, the post-Soviet neighborhood, is traveling to Turkey increasingly. This was referred to in the earlier presentation. The only way where I disagree or differ from the earlier, the, er, the, the earlier point that was made, these are not only tourists. Amongst them, there are many business people, there are many students, there are many civil society activists. There is very serious people-to-people -people interaction that is taking place. And the transformative, uh, transformative part of this is uh, NGOs from Georgia, Azerbaijan, even Armenia, not to mention Ukraine, Russia, Moldova, sharing their experiences and their experiences with their European Union counterparts in Istanbul mostly, rarely in Ankara, sometimes in Izmir, often in Antalya, because these people cannot travel to the European Union due to the Schengen visa uh, complications and restrictions. Yes, there's to you a con concrete example of how that tra contribution to transformation takes place. With business people moving back and forth, starting already from the early 1990s, you have a, a, a kind of exportation or a transfer of Turkish liberal market experti expertise, knowledge, to your counterparts in Georgia, Ukraine, uh, uh, and elsewhere in the, uh, in the neighborhood, the Middle East as well, especially Egypt. It doesn't stop there. Then comes the academia, then comes the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the experts. I made references to my trip to Damascus as we were waiting for the flight back to Istanbul it, as, and as we waited in the boarding in the, uh, uh, in the lounge there, it was very interesting to meet a member of the Turkish, uh, Turkish state planning organization that was returning from an exercise where they had run a training seminar for their Syrian counterparts to teach them how to adopt World Trade Organization's rules and how to develop a customs a manual uh, with respect to tr trade. That's the level at which Syria was, and that another is an, uh, an example of that transformative uh, exercise. So we must not think of purely trade. Much more important is investment. Turkey is always thought of as a country that receives foreign direct investment. But Turkey also exports foreign direct investment. 
The majority of that foreign direct investment, interestingly, comes to the United States and to the European Union, where there is rule of law. But a, a respectable amount of it goes to Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, from uh, the uh, from uh, the uh, the bakery, the baker from Trabzon opening up a bakery in Romania, uh, to the big big holdings of Turkey opening up factories in some, uh, some of these uh, countries. So a contribution there too is being made into that that exercise of easing uh, the area into. Finally, again, Turkey has for long been thought of as a country that sends immigrants abroad, a country of emigration. Whereas uh, for the last good 10 years, 15 years, Turkey has become increasingly an immigration country. So Moldovans, Bosnians, Georgians, Armenians come and work in Turkey and send their remittances to their respective countries exactly the same way as Turkish gastarbeiter used to do back in the 60s and 70s. Some of that inevitably, again, gets channeled into, uh, into that uh, exercise there. Turkey is drifting away from, from that exercise. And the domestic turbulence is beginning to impact on these qualities as companies are falling victim to the state of law rather than enjoy the rule of law. Now, I haven't done a systematic study of this. There may be studies taking place. But the number of business association people that have come and talked to me in Washington, DC, about their problems they are encountering right now in the Turkish economy because of that turbulence is more than just an anecdotal. What is also interesting is that I am getting invitations, and that's my last point, I'm getting invitations from business associations as far apart as Malatyalılar İşler, Malatyalı İş Adamları Derneği. Malatya is a town in central Anatolia who has become one of those Anatolian tigers. Anatolian tigers, the, re the term is used for referring to these towns in, Anat in Anatolia that have become engines of export for small and medium-sized companies. They are inviting me such associations, not the big ones, the big ones are doing it, but smaller associations, to ask me about TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And I will conclude my talk with references to uh, TTIP and why it is of significance in the context in which uh, I am presenting to you these uh, ideas. I'm sure from the media you're familiar that the o Obama administration is involved in a very difficult exercise that is facing increasing congressional resistance and challenge to negotiate with the European Union, this partnership I made references to, and with a group of Pacific nation, Asia Pacific nations, to negotiate the Transatlantic, uh, uh, Trans-Pacific partner, uh, Partnership. The two together, the two together, if the partnership are indeed negotiated and put into place, is going to create a market that will constitute 63% of the world's gross domestic product and will involve 42% of the world's trade. It's not there yet. There are all kinds of complications, and one of the biggest complications is that the Congress will not let Obama have a renewed trade promotion authority, which would allow Obama's administration to negotiate a deal and then bring it to the Congress, and the Congress would just vote, it, vote for it or vote uh, against it. This is a serious complication, not to mention complications to do with technicalities in, in there. This morning, again, Karen made references to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that the Turkish Prime Minister would like to see Turkey join. Uh, the, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, together with the BRICS, 
constitute 21% of the world's GDP, and they command 18% of the world trade. I think the figures in themselves, yes, the, the figures speak for themselves uh, in, in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, what the players in there are a aiming for or what they, they, they mean. What is TTIP and TPP about? Very briefly. It's about, as some have put it, developing the 21st century's trade book. It is not just about lowering customs duties and trade tariffs, but it's more about harmonizing uh, trading, trading and business uh, rules and regulations. Just to give you an example, today the way in which the United States treats its chicken or prepares its chicken for uh, marketing and consumption is different than the one in uh, the European Union. So these two differences mean that the American chicken can't be sold in Europe and the European one can't be sold here. Same applies for Mercedes cars. Mercedes cars made in Tennessee cannot be sold easily. It can be, but you need modifications, and modifications means costs. And uh, the ones produced in Germany cannot be sold without the additional cost of modifications in the United States. So uh, the parties to the partnership are trying to harmonize these to be able to open up this economy. This is geostrategically very significant, because if they can do that, there will be economic growth, there will be greater economic prosperity, greater resources, and a greater ability to influence geopolitical and strategic issues in, uh, in, uh, in the world. Let me ask you this question. Would Russia or Putin be able to handle this crisis the way it, he's doing it if it was 10 years ago when the European Union economic boom was still in, in place? So your economic performance inevitably impacts on, uh, on political, geopolitical, and geostrategic uh, is issues uh, there. Finally, where does Turkey fit in this? Interestingly, the Turkish prime minister wrote a private letter to Obama asking him to support Turkey sitting at the negotiating table uh, for the TTIP. This was not possible because Turkey is not a member of the European Union. When he came here in May, he raised this issue too. In uh, November, when the foreign minister came to Washington, D.C., he had an article published in Foreign Policy where he advocates that involving Turkey in TTIP would be a means, watch this, a means of re-anchoring Turkey in the West. Right? So this elite that we've been talking about, or part of that elite, is behind this TTIP, recognizing not only the rec uh, economic but the political implications uh, of it as well. But right now, Turkey risks being left out of it. And being left out of it also means that because Turkey has a customs union with the European Union, if and when TTIP is put an, into place, American goods are going to enter Turkey freely. That's how the customs union works. But Turkish goods and services will not be able to enter uh, the United States uh, market. And I'll let you uh, speculate on what that will mean in terms of anti-Americanism in Turkey, that the uh, calculations have already been made that on a yearly basis, this would cost Turkey between 20, 23 billion dollars and it would also lead to loss of jobs. Interestingly, Canada, uh, Mexico would also be losers. In other words, this deal works in such a way that parties to the deal benefit from it significantly, but those parties that have bilateral links to the parties of TTIP end up losing 
jobs, losing business, and losing their trade. So, I warned you about the Turkish professor. <laughs> Luckily, there's only been a couple of people who've left so far. And uh, <coughs> in the absence of a project and in the absence of a vision that AKP was able to put into place in 2002, 2003, Turkey needs a new project, a new vision. And I, my humble opinion, is that one way to engage Turkey in such a project is to engage Turkey through this TTIP, if not through a free trade agreement being negotiated between the two sides, Turkey and the uh, United States, which would allow effectively by default Turkey becoming part of TTIP as well as part of TPP if eventually this uh, scheme, uh, this scheme uh, succeeds and is uh, is put into uh, into place, and this would also be a, a way of replacing the role of the European Union had played in 2004, 2005, 2006. And I shall leave you with wondering why is it that Malatya Malatyalı the business the business. Uh, and it's interesting, it's businessmen, it's not business people. Businessman of Malatya wants to hear about T TTIP. Thanks.